Hello everyone. I want to wish a happy birthday to Quantisty and uh, best wishes. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, the topic today is uh, complexity, reflexivity, and regime changes in financial markets and how this impact quantitative strategy development. Uh, complexity and reflexivity are interrelated and uh, caused by regime changes. We will see that in the presentation. Uh, please note that uh, there is no investment advice in this uh, presentation. All the results are hypothetical. And uh, trading, as you know, most of you, if not all of you, is uh, very risky. About me, I think uh, I did uh, cover that. Uh, I use Norgate data and uh, analysis and back testing is done in AMI broker. I also do some uh, statistical analysis in R. Let's go directly to the first slide. I don't use a summary because so a summary is to help the author, not the audience. What you see here is the strategy from 1941 to 1999. It is uh, a strategy with S&P 500 index daily data and the long positions are entered if there is an update which is equivalent to a positive return or the price being above the two-day moving average and the short positions when these conditions are reversed. So you see here this simple strategy had an annualized return of 27.6% and a sharp ratio of about 2.5 in a period of 60 years. Now, many of you or some of you have never seen this. This is not taught in business schools or economics departments. The reason is that this refutes the efficient market hypothesis. How can a simple strategy outperform, buy and hold with such a wide margin. Of course, there is a caveat here. This is not a practical strategy, but a way of identifying the regime shifts. In the period from 41 to 1999, the buy and hold annualized return was about 9% versus 27.7 for the strategy. But before 1993 and the SPYTF, it was impossible for retail to trade this strategy. And for professionals and funds, they had to use a tracking portfolio. And that was a big business in the 90s for the younger of you to know. There were companies that developed small tracking portfolios for the S&P 500 from about 10 to 30 securities. And the reason was to reduce transaction cost. But uh, you will see that the long only worked until the late 90s because the long short strategy became somewhat erratic after 
the slow regime shift for moving averages. Uh, here is a table from a paper I have written, limitations of quantitative claims about trading strategy evaluation. All moving averages from with the period from 2 to 20 outperformed the buy and hold for the long only part of the strategy if price is greater than the moving average and sell if price is lower than the moving average. And there were large T statistics, meaning that this appeared to be a very, very significant strategy. For instance, you could use an 11 day moving average and reduce transaction cost by an order of magnitude and end up with a T statistic of 8.5. What's the problem here? Let's see, let's see what's the problem here. This is what happened after 2000. Someone in the 90s backtested a simple strategy that worked for 50 or 55 years and thought they would be rich in the next 20 years. Instead, they got very poor. This strategy after 2000 lost nearly 100%. And I'm talking the long short strategy. And the same happened to all the moving averages versions. Why? This is interesting. Let's see why. A regime shift started developing in U.S. stock market in the mid 80s and was completed by the late 90s. The shift goes from momentum to mean reversion in daily returns. In the momentum regime, simple momentum strategies profited and simple mean reversion strategies were highly profitable. In the mean reversion regime that followed, Momentum strategies were unprofitable, while mean reversion strategies were profitable. So this is what happened, a major regime change. And the cause of this regime change was reflexivity that resulted in a very crowded trade in the 90s in the US stock market, everyone bought stocks to become rich. Does it sound familiar? Now let's look at a trivial mean reversion strategy. You go long if there are back-to-back -back losses and you exit if there are back-to-back -back gains. So two, two uh, days up, you go long, uh, uh, two days down, you go long, and two days up, you exit. This was a highly unprofitable strategy until about 1990. But this is what happened afterwards. The strategy became highly profitable until the recent pandemic crash. The reason this happened is that in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was high one lag autocorrelation in daily S&P 500 returns. You can see this from this autocorrelation chart. You see that in the 40s, 50s, autocorrelation is high, then it becomes extreme in the 70s, and then it starts dropping again. And then by mid-90s, there is a regime change, and autocorrelation becomes 
negative. And from extreme momentum in the 70s, now due to the pandemic crash, there is extreme mean reversion. You see down here. What does positive autocorrelation mean? It means that up days are followed by up days with higher probability and down days are followed by down, down days with higher probability. Negative autocorrelation means that up days are followed by down days with higher probability and the other way around for down and up days. So basically, in the 70s, there was extreme momentum in the markets, and this fooled a lot of people, especially the technical analysts. So we went, uh, the market went from extreme momentum to extreme mini reversion. And the extreme momentum in the 70s, in the 70s, fooled a lot of people, especially the technical analysts, that they thought a simple compression like uh, chart patterns would to be able to provide profits. And although it did for some time, uh, uh, then it stopped working by the late 90s. And the reason was the positive autocorrelation and when the markets became mean reverting, only by the deep work, as we will see. So how is it possible that a mean reverting market goes up? Before we get to that, I will introduce an indicator that I have developed. It's called the Momersion Indicator. The Momersion indicator is from momentum and mean reversion. It's a very simple indicator. It measures the relative uh, momentum and mean reversion of the market in daily returns. Higher Momersion Horizon indicates higher horizon momentum and lower or falling momentum indicates higher rising mean reversion. The pseudo and AMI broker code are available in my site and at the end I have the link and I think Quantisty also have, they have a Python code. Okay, so you will see, you see here in this chart in the 50s and 60s and 70s up to the 80s, momentum was very high. And then from 85 to about 2000, there was a regime change process. And then from 2000, the indicator shows that the market became mostly mean reverting. Okay. So, I cannot share the AFL code uh, in, the, in the screen. I think you have to go to the site. Okay, I saw a question about this. Okay, so how do markets arise when they are mean reverting? This is a puzzle, okay? All right, this is how they arise. Before we, we we see the, let's look at the Indian market. Some people are interested. The Indian market has been in a momentum regime in the 90s and in 2003, but these regimes were followed by a fast decline to neutral territory. And then in two, 2009, the Indian market became slightly mean reverting Again, by 2015, momentum rose, and then there was a fast decline, and then a rise again. So you get now an idea 
of regime shifts and how difficult is the Indian market to trade because of these fast regime shifts from momentum to mini reversion. Let's look Let's look at gold. Gold futures back adjusted with the Panama method have been mostly mean reverting. Although there are trends, up and down trends, okay? And back to the chart I wanted to show, this is the reason mean reverting markets go up. The S&P 500 rises under mean reversion because more down days are followed by up days. Recently, the percentage of down days followed by up days in a 252-day rolling period about a year reached new all-time highs at about 69, you see here. This is caused by participants buying the dips. So market is mean reverting, people buy the dips and they make money. And the market goes up, everyone is happy. The great run of that simple strategy I showed was caused by reflexivity. What is reflexivity? The actions of market participants influence prices and in turn the prices influence the actions of market participants. And this is a positive feedback system. Reflexivity causes degraded forecasting accuracy. For instance, the weather forecasting. No matter what these guys can do, they cannot affect a sunny day. There will not be any rain. But this is not the case in the markets. The markets are complex, non-linear, stochastic, positive feedback systems. You have the forecasts. And that are part of the market, they actually place trades. And you have also forecasts that are not parts of the markets, and, uh, but they influence the input of the mar to the market. So this is a feedback system, it's highly non-linear. Uh, the presentation will uh, be made available in my website uh, uh, to, by tomorrow, okay? For some people who got it disconnected. Now, reflexivity causes boom and bust cycles. Example is Bitcoin. Everyone thought Bitcoin will go higher, like to a million in the 2018, and everyone bought until the trade became unsustainable and Bitcoin crashed. This was a reflexivity period. And the result is high complexity, uh, regime changes. So let's talk briefly about complexity. What is complexity? Because some people are aware, but many people are not, that there is this thing called the curse of dimensionality. If you have many input variables to the system, then you can de define an N hypersphere. The content, vol or also called the volume of the N hypersphere, is given by this formula. You can find this in math world. Now, what is the curse of dimensionality? 
also called peaking phenomena. If we normalize the variables in the unit interval, we get a unit n hypersphere and the volume, the surface of this unit hypersphere reaches a maximum for about seven dimensions and then asymptotically goes to zero. For more than 20 variables, all possible solutions are extreme. There is nothing inside the N hypersphere. All the volume is uh, concentrated at the edges. Okay, this was very brief. This is a, a very deep subject, okay? Uh, but what you keep is that any system that tries to juggle too many variables at once usually collapses, like the Soviet Union, central control. There are no solutions, okay? Same will happen to EU and maybe United States. That's why people are talking about decentralization. Okay, so the bad news, the accuracy of the forecasts under complexity is very low. Actually, forecasts are random. The forecast the economists make are random. You cannot forecast price levels, GDP levels. You cannot forecast anything under high com complexity. The distributions are not known. There are unstable modes, like in 2008 financial crisis. And there are absorbing barriers, like ankle point or ruin for traders. There are some relatively good news. Certain problems in finance involve selection or ranking, portfolio allocation, plus one include asset, minus one exclude asset, trading, plus one buy cover, minus one sell short. The main problem is discovering the signal in the noise which is also called feature engineering in machine learning. Anchor point is when you cannot continue. You lost too much money, you cannot continue. Supervised machine learning is useful as an added layer. Oops. The challenge is the bias variance trade off, underfitting versus overfitting. This is a huge challenge in a quantitative strategy design. So let's go back to that original slide. We had this great reflexivity run. The market went straight up in a, uh, with a few you know, corrections, and a very simple strategy was able to outperform it. What does this mean? What are the effects of this great reflexivity run on the markets? We define reflexivity as a process where the actions of market participants influence prices and in turn prices influence the actions of market participants. The crowded trade continues until it becomes unsustainable and the reason it becomes unsustainable is that the market does not have an infinite resources to pay everyone. The unstable modes are triggered 
regime change follows gradually or even abruptly. Strategies that worked in a previous regime fail in the next. Now, this applies to monthly data, weekly data, daily data, down to fractions of a second. All traders should understand this. This is how the markets work. They work by switching regimes. Now, during some reflexivity phase, success is usually attributed to naive models or skill, when in fact it is due to luck. In most cases, like you have this contest, context, contest in the uh, forex uh, broker for three months, and someone makes a thousand percent. Yes, because they they were lucky. Out of many people, someone made a thousand percent because they used by chance the correct model. Now. If you leave this model for the next three months, they will probably lose everything. But they never tell you what happened afterwards. Traders think over-optimized models work better in forward samples. Traders underestimate fat tails and associated risks. Fat tails are things that are not normally distributed. They have a lot of risk in the tails of the distributions. And the quants assume that more complex models could generate better predictions. Neural networks, machine learning, deep learning. Some of these misconceptions can be found even in academic papers. Momentum and mean reversion strategies alone can usually cannot deal effectively with the regime changes. Recall that reflexivity causes the complexity and the complexity then with the reflexivity they cause the regime changes. A good strategy must accommodate both momentum and mean reversion, but it is difficult to develop. If a strategy that accommodates both momentum and mean reversion is not available, then separate strategies may be used. Unique hypothesis versus Strategy suggested by the data is what comes to mind next. So, combine momentum and mean reversion strategies with regime filters. Develop effective regime filters that do not reduce sample size and do not cause large drawdown is hard. Lagging indicators may adversely affect performance, like moving averages. Timing must be nearly exact for avoiding whipsaw. Like, if there is a change from momentum to mean reversion in any time frame, but your regime filter is late in detecting that, then your momentum or trend following system will face whipsaw and generate losses. So the timing must be good, if not nearly exact. Trivial example, combine moving average cross with a short period RSI. A short period RSI is usually a mean reversion. Uh, algorithm and a uh, moving average cross is a uh, price series momentum but 
the easy pedestrian strategies are unlikely to perform well. Now, let's get into something more interesting. Strategies suggested by the data usually offer a good mix of momentum and mean reversion signals. But there are many problems. There is no free lunch. Machine learning, genetic programming, neural networks, and even simple permutation methods have been used to develop strategies. It's like a big pot. You put all these basic algos and then you mix everything inside and you hope that you get a tasty soup. But it doesn't work that way. The fundamental problem of strategies suggested by data, meaning that we try to identify the strategy from the data. We are agnostic and we have some procedure that identifies the strategy by analyzing the data. Is the bias. The problem is the bias due to multiple comparisons and data snooping. I have some articles, uh, links on the page you will see at the end uh, from my blog about uh, multiple comparisons and data snooping. In a nutshell, if you torture the data long enough, they will confess to anything, but the strategies will be random and overfitted to noise. There are ways of minimizing the bias to reduce the overfitting to noise, but that is essentially the edge. People don't realize that. The edge, it's how you reduce bias. It's not the strategy you use at the end of the day. It's how you reduce bias and you avoid the strategy fitting to the noise. So it generalizes in the future. Forward sample. I can offer you some general guidelines in this uh, short presentation. Use a small set of similar features or, or indicators that have economic value. The more indicators you use, the, highest, the, the higher the probability that you will get a spurious random system. You have to test out of sample only once and generate sufficient samples. If you use the sample, the out of sample, several times, then you are introducing data snooping and the probability of being fooled by type one error or false positive becomes very high. So try not to use the out of sample many times. If you want to find a strategy for a market, make a few tries, make a few out of sample tests, maybe no more than five, 10, okay? And you will still have bias, but small. And then you have to have sufficient samples. I see some people, I see some people doing back tests and they have like 20, 30, 50 trades. You need hundreds or thousands of trades to start even talking about significant results. So what are those interesting facts that we can use or features? Are, they com are these the complex facts or the simple? You see, Henry Poincaré, 
in Science and Hypothesis in 1913 spoke about this in a different context, but it's very interesting. When I read it, I saw the link immediately to trading. He wrote, the most interesting facts are those that may serve many times. So are those that can generate trades many times. These are the facts which have a chance of coming up again. So you will have trades in the future. Which then are the facts likely to reappear? They are the simple facts. Because the complex facts have very low probability to, to reappear. And people don't realize that. The economists that do the forecasts and they use these complex indicators, those conditions, they will never appear again. So they have no significance in the forecasts. And here is the $42 million question. But are there any simple facts? And if they are, how recognize them? This is where every trader should concentrate on. Okay? Are there any simple facts? And if they, there are, how recognize them? This is the job of the successful trader. And I give you an example how we do it in one minute. For, for instance, for long short trading in daily time frame, we have N securities, uh, M price action anomalies, symbol rules. And uh, T is the number of trades of a rule in the security. And then we have PL, the win fraction of every rule in every security for long positions. And PS is the win fraction of every rule in every security for short positions. And then we define the ensemble averages which are PL and sample average is the way trade weighted win fraction for long positions and PS is the trade weighted win fraction for short positions. And then we take the difference and this gives us a probability of directional move and also will calculate the significance of BI for every security, okay, I securities. And then we use a rank matrix, BI times SI. So we multiply the significance by the directional bias. And we do that every period daily or 30 minutes. Now we have some uh, customers that are doing it every 30 minutes. So we, you start at T0, you identify your symbol rules. Machine learning, for instance, we used unsupervised machine learning for that. And then we calculate the features and we do the ranking and then we have the supervised machine learning layer to select the best alternatives. And then we repeat every time period. Okay. I'm sorry, I can go into more details about this. We're over the allocated time of 40 minutes. Thank you so much, all of you, for listening. Uh, and I will try after the uh, uh, moderator, uh, he has a message for you. I will try to explain the, to answer the questions. Okay. Uh, so 
you can go to this uh, this link priceactionlab.com blog quant ist and there is a link to a free book profitability and systematic trading was published by Will in 2008. And in the above, above blog page, you will find links to articles related to this presentation. Okay? So write down this link and go there and you will find the articles related to overfitting, uh, backtesting, about this presentation and some offers from Quantisty and Price Action Lab blog and a link to 131 free articles and a PDF book download. Okay, back to Aditya. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, uh, for your insightful presentation. Uh, I'm sure our audience today got a lot of notes to take back and uh, imbibe in their analysis and trading routine. So the first question actually, which we have is from Dimitri, and he wanted to understand uh, what do you mean by economic value of strategy or an indicator? Yeah, by economic value, I mean that uh, uh, the strategy or indicator can find the signal instead of for uh, the noise, okay? So it has signal. Uh, that's what uh, I mean, basically. Uh, uh, you know, it's very hard to go into details, uh, but uh, this is what is meant by having economic value. All right. Uh, the second question which we have is, uh, can you please help me understand what absorbing barrier means? Uh, what, uh, can you repeat? The absorbing barriers. Uh, absorbing barrier is when there is a stop. For instance, for instance, Russian roulette, just to give a bad example, uh, you know, the, if you get the bullet, that's an absorbing barrier. Okay, the process finishes. There is no more process. Okay, and so, so for a trader, uh, if he hits a stop, cumulative stop, that's an absorbing barrier. Cannot continue. Okay. That's basically what it is. It, it comes from uh, uh, basically molecules, but uh, in Brownian motion, but we have extended this to trading very loosely. Okay, next. All right. Uh, Debian asked that uh, can a strategy with good backtesting results uh, that uses adaptive stop loss perform stably over regime shifts? Yes, and uh, uh, Debian says that's a naive question, but it's not naive. It's a very good question, actually. Uh, yeah, every strategy has, from one perspective, has two main parts, the timing of the entry and the timing of the exit, okay? Uh, in the question, we are asked about whether the timing of the exit can help. Well, if you are in a mean reversion territory and the system has taken a momentum trade, and if the stop is adaptive, it has to be a tight stop. Otherwise, losses will increase. So in principle, you know, this is a good idea, but to find out a way to, to, to tune the stops, 
because, of, for instance, mini reversion systems performance breaks down under stops, but stops can be used with momentum. To figure out, it's very tricky. It's a very good question. Uh, I haven't been able myself to find a good answer to this. I have been able to find good answer to the entry part problem, but not to the exit. But it's a very good question. Okay, next. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, Omega asks that uh, how do you evaluate if a given trading strategy is overfitted? Um, he thinks that it's too simple to just count the number of parameters. Um, even a strategy with a single parameter can be overfitted. So what would this, be your uh, thoughts on that? This is a very good question. You know, people here are very smart, Adita. Very smart. This is a good question. O okay. If you count the number of parameters you get, you may get an idea of whether the strategy is overfitted, but you run the risk of type 2 error. Type 2 error is false rejection. You may reject a good strategy. So, in my opinion, you should go further than this. For instance, in my book, in my last book, Fooled by Technical Analysis, it's available online uh, in my blog. I offer specific ways of testing strategies to see if they are overfitted. For instance, one way is remove all exits and put a very small target and stop. How does that affect the win fraction? If the strategy had a 90 or 75 percent fraction before, and when you do that, it gets down to 40, that means the signals, the entry signals, go random. And there are many ways you can also do statistical analysis, bootstrapping of the uh, strategy returns. You can compare to random trading. You can do stochastic modeling. You can inject noise in the price series to see how the strategy. It's a, you know, it, it, it gets beyond that, but it's all, always good. I agree. Always good to limit the number of parameters. Next question. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, by Calvin, and he says that uh, momentum and mean reversion regimes are obvious in hindsight, but how do you determine which regime you're currently in? Is this what Momotion Indicator talks about? Uh, yeah, this is a good point, but everything in financial markets is known in hindsight, even trend, even trends. Because no matter how long is the trend, the next tick can be the ultimate reversal. So in markets, we know everything in hindsight. That's why we use historical analysis. This is a good question. No, the Momersion indicator is not a strategy. The Momersion indicator, it's a descriptive indicator of market dynamic. It can be used in strategies, but there is work to be done. Okay? Like with every descriptive indicator. No indicator is predictive. At least I don't know any indicator except, you know, the large crystal ball. Okay, next. All right. Um, so this is the last question we'll be taking, and it's by Sergi. Uh, he's asking, what are the examples of price and uh, anomalies, and what are the best ways to quantify their probabilities? Okay. What are examples of price anomalies? Uh, you know, that's that's a question right to the point. I mean, 
<laughs> I mean, I like this kind of questions. You know, I can uh, talk about the general, you know, because it's proprietary, but I can give you uh, an example, overnight trading. You know, I just had an article in my blog today. The bulk, 99.9% .9 of the profits in SPY ETF since it was traded have come from the overnight section. From the overnight session. Okay, that's an anomaly. For instance, I'm not saying use that. Another anomaly. People buy... There is a tendency of, for people to buy gold during the weekend. Maybe for hedging purposes, maybe they are afraid. So now, you know, think about this. Maybe, maybe a triple inside day is an anomaly. Okay, so you go over this, but you need some kind of automated machine learning we use unsupervised, okay, to get the clusters, which ones to use. So anything that gives you profit from the market is essentially an anomaly. Okay, next. All right, Michael, thank you uh, so much. That was the last question. Uh, there, we're getting a significant amount of questions and uh, I think it'd be great uh, if uh, our audience can uh, uh, let us know about these questions over to our mail. Um, we can then uh, reply to them over mail itself. And our email ID is quantra.quantency.com. Um, so you can let us know uh, all the questions and uh, we will uh, get you an answer from Michael himself. And uh, Michael, thank you so much for taking out the time and uh, speaking to our audience today. Uh, your presentation was indeed uh, uh, very thoughtful and uh, I'm certain that uh, we will all uh, benefit uh, greatly from it. So we just hope to see more and more educational content coming from your end of the future. And uh, I think uh, with this, I, I, I also like to thank the audience for joining us today.